Philippians 1, verse 18. If you follow along, please. Paul says, What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that at nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or death. Or death. And by the way, somebody asked you, why should I study the Bible? Just have them read Philippians 1. <laughs> I have to study the title. You got to dig, y'all. Anyway, verse 21. To live is Christ, to die is gain. And if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. We'll stop our reading there. Let's pray together, if you will. Now, Father, you know the uneducated mind you think of, since he knows, is no use boring him with details. But your Bible tells us that because you know, we're to bring our petitions. I don't know how that works, but I know it's so. You know then this morning, God, I have nothing to offer anyone. But what we're doing here today has nothing to do with me. It has to do with your people gathered in your house on your day. Now with your Bible in their laps or in their hands. And we're turning to you, God, because we need to hear your word. We need to understand your word. Your word is where our faith comes from. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. And with faith, that's the victory that we have over the world through our faith. So, God, we need you today. We need to hear your word. So please, God, remove any and all distractions, whether it be in the pulpit or the pew, and help us, Lord, just focus on not anything that I say, but, God, on what you've already said in your word. We ask it in Jesus' name that all God's people said. Amen. Amen. I've entitled my message this morning, Conversation That Becomes the Gospel. Now Paul's in jail, obviously, as we pick up in verse 20, facing death. We don't know all of the actual uh, legal dynamics. We know he was imprisoned initially, Acts 21, because his Jewish brothers accused him of breaking their tradition. He was labeled later, Acts 24, verse 5, by the same crowd as a mover of sedition. And that literally means that he was a stirrer up of controversy. Don't you love troublemakers? Well, Rome's initial interest was, first of all, to keep Paul from being murdered by this irate crowd. Uh, but then secondly, it was to keep peace in their jurisdiction. Now, Paul could have faced these quote-unquote charges locally. But of course, as you know, as a Roman citizen, he had a right to stand before the emperor and make his own defense, which is what he chose to do. Trouble was, in this court, there were no appeals. Uh, I was going to say there weren't any New York lawyers, but there may be somebody from New York. Yeah, I got to be careful. Close. Close. C. 
Caesar's rule was unquestionable law. It's almost hard for us to grasp that, but it's true. Caesar decided that a troublemaker should be made an example and executed because he disturbed the peace of Rome, that that's exactly what would happen. Paul tells us his earnest expectation and hope, though, was that regardless of the outcome, he would never be ashamed of Christ, that he would never be ashamed of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Y'all, he lived where we live. Right? I, I, I would hate to own up to it in public, but there have been times when I've felt that very thing. Paul says, that's what I'm hoping. Whether living or dying, that Jesus would be magnified. The word means literally what it would today. Made bigger by my body. I'd say this old boy was sold out, wouldn't you? So Paul knows that his immediate future was uncertain. He could live and could die. Verse 21, he gives us his perspective, if you will, of these two possible outcomes. If I continue to live, it'll be for Jesus' sake. It'll be to serve his purposes only. If I die, it'll be for my sake. It'll be to better my purposes. And then pondering these two quote-unquote outcomes, Paul writes, verse 22, to continue to live will result, by God's grace, in more fruitful labor. But which of these two possible outcomes that I would actually prefer or choose, I don't really know. Verse 23 says I'm in a strait between these two choices. Uh, the word communicates I'm uh, between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. You ever been on a path that's so narrow that you couldn't turn? You'd have to go forward, go backward. That's what's being pictured here. I'm in this hard place, if you will. 23, the second part of the verse, says to depart and be with Christ is far better. That almost doesn't sound right. But life is good. I, I have everything that a man could possibly ever want. And then a whole bunch more. But the Bible says, and my faith and your faith has embraced this, that to depart to die is better. Amen. Puts a whole different perspective on the funeral part of it. Mm -hmm. Verse 24, though, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Both of these possible outcomes, both of these arguments are very compelling. But then we read verse 25 and 26. And it would appear that in Paul's mind the issue has been resolved. And I'll paraphrase if you'll permit it. Being persuaded of the effects of both of these two possible outcomes, I feel sure that I'll remain alongside together with you for your advancement in the faith and for the joy that you can experience through this life of faith. And then comes verses 27 and following. And as it would appear, an abrupt change in the thinking, in the flow of thought here. And again, if you'll explain excuse a paraphrase, Paul says, but regardless of what happens to me, whether I come to you or not, whether I see you again in this life or not, whether I continue in the flesh or not, verse 27, let your conversation be as becometh the gospel. To me, it would be as if he says, listen, let's not get distracted by what might be Let's not get sidetracked by what could be, to coin a rather uh, popular phrase of a few years ago. Let's keep the main thing here, the main thing, and that is never forget as Christians we've got to live right. As Christians we've got to live right. If you will, someone said, verse 27, Paul went from theology to meology. An old boy many, many years ago put it this way. Paul's gone from preaching and took up meddling. How many of us would be more comfortable if the preacher only talked theology and left sanctification out of the picture? Anybody? Mm. Then you know what meddling's all. In fact, they told the story of an old sister sitting on the back row of the church. Make sure, well, you know, we don't have any sisters on the back row. <laughs> Janet wants to be, you say? Oh, okay. 
the preacher talked about every sin known to man finally got down to, to uh, dipping snuff. <laughs> me, me and you, brother, only two old enough in here know what that was. <laughs> she got up in a huff and left and said he's gone from preaching to meddling now. <laughs> verse 27, two definitions to help me fine-tune this verse. first one is that word conversation. Conversation today, of course, means sitting down and having a chat with someone. Or like the old boy in the restaurant the other day, he had some kind of electronic gizmo tacked to the side of his head. And to me, he was talking to his pizza. <laughs> All of you technical folks know better what I'm talking about than I do. Conversation, the word, the English word is used 18 times in the New Testament, 16 times from a Greek word, anastrophe. I'm sure I don't pronounce that right. But it means behavior, a lifestyle. Let your behavior, your lifestyle be thus and such. Two times, though, it comes from the Greek word polit uomahi, and I know I've told that one all pieces. But interestingly, both times it's translated from that Greek word or found in the book of uh, Philippians. It's where we get our English word politics or political. And it literally means to behave as a citizen. <clears throat> to behave as a citizen. So. Initially, verse 27, Paul says, let your behavior as a citizen of the kingdom of God be as becometh the gospel. Definition number two, becometh. We don't hear that word very often. It simply means appropriate or deserving. So again, Paul says, let your behavior as a citizen of God's kingdom be appropriate for the gospel of Christ, be deserving of the gospel of Christ. Two obvious questions already. Number one, is your behavior appropriate for a citizen of the kingdom of God? Number two, does the gospel of Christ deserve what you did yesterday or what you're contemplating doing this afternoon. Then Paul says, verse 27, Whether I come to see you, or whether I be absent, that I may hear of your affairs. One last definition for my sake, if not yours. The word affairs is translated from the Greek word peri, P-E-R-I. P-E-R-I. I hesitate here uh, because it does help me. You've heard the word perimeter. Perimeter. The word peri literally means all around. Perimeter is to measure all around the circle, right? How about periscope? That means when you're down under the surface of the water, you can see all around. Any of you ladies ever had perinatal care? Literally means anything around the subject of birth is what this doctor tends to. How about periodontics? That's a good one. It means care for what's around the teeth. And in my case, it's gums, lip, whiskers, and a brother. <laughs> periodontics. So, Paul says, whether I come to see you or be absent, that I may hear of your all around. That I may hear of your entire lifestyle that I may hear of every aspect of your life. Obvious question then would be, well, what did Paul want to hear about these Philippians disciples? And if you will, what does God want to hear about us, about our lives? Three things Paul wanted to hear, or if you will, three aspects of church behavior that's appropriate for a citizen of the kingdom of God. And by the way, in case you didn't know, we believe the Bible to literally be the Word of God. We do not believe that it contains the Word of God. We do not believe that it was once the Word of God. We do not believe that it's an ongoing revelation containing the Word of God. It is the Word of God. That explains why I preach the way I do and why I would make a big deal out of th two verses here and three things that coincidentally are listed 
after having told us this is how you're supposed to be living if you really are going to be a good citizen of the kingdom of God. Number one, that we stand fast in one spirit, verse 27. Number two, that we with one mind strive together for the faith of the gospel, verse 27. And number three, that in nothing we're terrified by our adversaries, verse 28. Number one, that we stand fast in one spirit, from verse 27. God wants us to be, as the word stand fast translates, stationary, or to put it in Bible talk, He wants us to persevere. Persevere, but we're to do it together in one spirit. We are individual disciples, but we make up a whole unit. Amen? We as the body of Christ are a unit. We're to think and we're to act like a unit as if we were being blown by one wind. You say, what in the world do you get that from? That's what the word spirit means. Breath, wind, blast of air. We're to be so united that it's if one single blast of air, or if you will, the spirit, is blowing us all in the same direction. In fact, if you add to that our second aspect, that we with one mind strive together for the faith of the gospel, it paints a picture for us. And you're going to think, no, I don't. You're crazy. You're as crazy as you look, and that's real crazy. It paints a picture of a wrestling match. How many of you have watched a wrestling match lately? Or maybe a wrestling <laughs> match. Every time I say that, she always says, that's the wrong match. How about this one? Tag team wrestling match. Where in the world do you get that from? The word strive together used in the King James literally means, this is the truth, to wrestle in company with. Why do I have to study the Bible? Well, because if you don't, you miss most of it. When you go in, do you just lay your hands down on the menu when you go in the restaurant and feel of it a little bit? Oh, I know what I want now. You may. Some of you skinny folk, I don't know why you need to start with. <laughs> I ain't skinny and I know why I eat. If it don't taste good, I don't want it. And before it tastes good, before I find out if it tastes good or not, I want them to say something in the menu about what it is. I told you the other day about going in a restaurant and they didn't have hamburger on the menu. They had cheeseburger. I told him I want a hamburger, a cheeseburger, and hold the cheese. He looked at me like I was a nut. <laughs> I want to look at the menu. I want to see what it says. If I don't understand the words, I typically don't order it. Amen. Thank you. I can go on my next morning. Why do we study the Bible? Because if you don't, you miss things. And this word here, these two words translate from one that means literally <clears throat> to wrestle in company with. And if you will, what we're looking at then is the idea of ch fellow church members acting as a team. A team. Now I'll go back again, uh, brother, to dip and snuff. you got to go way back. I can remember watching wrestling matches on TV when they had a tag team. Did anybody here know about that? I'll take my glasses off so I don't know I'm speaking to myself. <laughs> You got two guys on each team, and they don't wrestle all at the same time. You only got two of them out there at a time. But when guy number one off of team number A gets tired and wore out, if he can crawl, fall, roll, get pushed over to his corner, and get one hand out and slap his teammate, this is guy number B on team number A, He's still full of vinegar and vitality. He had chitlins and corn, uh, corn flakes for breakfast. He jumps all the way over all four of them ropes or whatever it is and beats the starch out of this other guy. Now he's all laid out. Well, it's all said and done, right? No, he starts vibrating his way across and his old boy reaches out and slaps his. Then they do the same thing over again. And that way that wrestling match can go on for two or three weeks, it looks to me like. The idea being that I'm trying to borrow is they act as a team. 
And because there's two of them and they're acting as a team, you've got a whole lot better chance of being the winners coming out on top. The Bible says that we in the church are to act as a team. And this may sound like some kind of new age foolishness. I don't mean it that way, y'all. This comes right off the pages of the Bible. A team. Together. You ever uh, watched a good team play some kind of game? In fact, the commentators uh, made the statement that to a, a Greek-Roman audience that by the context here, their thinking would immediately have gone to the Olympic game by the use of the words here. You ever watched a, a game uh, made up of teams playing? I don't know what your particular sport is. Uh, I've always enjoyed watching a baseball game. And so I'll use them as an example. Have you ever seen a good team play? And an overall perspective of that thing to me is they look like a well-oiled machine, everyone doing its part. If you're a baseball fan at all, you ever seen anybody get a triple play? That's a sight to behold. Some of y'all are thinking, what is baseball? <laughs> it's like the little boy the other day said, who's John Wayne? <laughs> Broke my heart. Man, just, you know, the, the pitcher kneels down and looks at the catcher. And, and the catcher's giving him signs. Either that or he's got ants in his pants. I don't know. But he's beating the inside of his thighs. Any of y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all could help me. I'll pay you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> so the pitcher nodded. I don't want to do that. Well, I'm thinking, why leave him look? You ain't going to do what he tells you. But then it reminds me of me. Fine, look how I'll do that. Winds up his fancy wind up, flings that thing down there. And uh, the old boy at the plate hits it out into the outfield. If you ever stop and pay attention, at the crack of the bat, every player on that nine man team moves. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. Now, I'm talking about a good team. <laughs> I ain't talking about, well, I won't mention that. Good team. The fielders all run, the outfielders, in the direction that the ball's going, not knowing whether it's going to come that far or not. The infielders instantly go into some sort of a strategy where, one, their bases are covered, and two, they're setting themselves up from the relay throw from the outfield if it gets that far. And then if you've got eyeballs enough to watch, watch the catcher. The catcher ought to get more money than anybody on the team. He's going to whichever side of the field, the ball, opposite side of the field, the ball is going on to back up the throw that will probably be coming in from the outfield. A well-oiled machine, H Park uh, doing its, its own respective part. Uh, it's not like you might think if you just watch the news or, or whatever the case may be. It's not like a star with his backup group. Yeah, I remember seeing the other day, I don't remember where it was, an old picture of Diana Ross and the Supremes. Anybody remember that? Mm -hmm. That was back in the days of different snubs. <laughs> <laughs> and if you recall, Diana Ross broke up with the Supremes and she soon went down the drain. And I thought, Diana, you may have had it wrong from the get-go. It may not have been you as the star with the backup. A good team is not a star with eight backup players. If you'll notice when one guy messes up, now this is generally speaking, and I'm talking about on a good team. One guy messes up, they don't go out there and punch him in the nose or pour Gatorade down his back. They go pat him on the back. Mm -hmm. And they may have selfish motives. I'm hoping you won't do this next time. <laughs> but the idea is they try and encourage one another because they're a team. And the old boy used to say, listen, this team will never be any stronger than the weakest man on the field. And it makes such perfect sense. If on the other hand, guy does good, they all rejoice. Yeah, oh, yeah, man. And they tell me, uh, in the uh, World Series, those guys win. All grades of catch for playing baseball. I played baseball, so I didn't have to do my homework. I believe I'd rather have what I got. Anyway, 
And nobody on a good team ever quits or pouts. Can't you just see the catcher? The, kid, the pitcher shakes his head. No, I don't want to throw that. What if the catcher got into a little pout bout? What do you mean you don't want to throw that pitch? I've been studying game film since last night's game. Throws his glove down, takes his mask off, play. I'm, I ain't going to play no more. You won't find that on a good team. Amen? Anybody? That's right. Nobody's envious of another pitch. I don't want to play the outfield. I want to be the pitcher. And if I can't pitch, I ain't going to play. Not on a good team, y'all. I don't know what goes on in the dugout and beyond, but out there on the field, them old boys, because of the nature of the game, realize if I don't act like a team member, this thing ain't going to work. And in their case, it means I ain't going to get no pay. And that means it's back to no chitlins, brother. What a time. <laughs> Ever seen a bad team play? They are like an unwell greased machine. You ever heard the expression grease burnt? Grease burnt? What my daddy used to say about a tool that had rusted up. Watch a team that's not a good team. They don't act, you know, in regards to one another's acting. They're not each doing their part. You've probably got a star or two out there on the field. Uh, this is not quite as far back as dipping snuff. There was an old boy that used to play for the Oakland A's, I believe it was. This has probably been 20 years ago. Uh, big bat. Knocked those things over the fence every time Franklin got up there. Jose Canseco. The only reason I mention his name is because I hope he hears this. <laughs> we stood after a, a A's Orioles game one night till about 1.30 in the morning waiting to get an autograph. All the little boys gathered around and me. <laughs> Finally, we found out which gate they were going to be coming out of, and we found that out because they had two great long lines of Baltimore City police all of a sudden formed <laughs> so these guys could walk through there. And uh, somehow the line busted up somehow, and a few of these stars, consecutively in one of them, looked at these little boys and scoffed. And I thought, I wish I had a tomato. <laughs> they ain't going to sign no autographs. We're too important. It won't long, y'all. You know, a month or two later, I just happened to be watching a news program, and they showed the Oakland A's playing somebody. Kaseko was the right fielder. Lost a ball in the sun one day. This is a true story. The ball came down, hit him on the head, bounced over the right field fence for a home run. <laughs> From that point forward, I figured I'm for anybody that's playing the Oakland A's. <laughs> stars. Well, old machine, they'll have stars with a backup band. Amen? If somebody does bad, they'll chew him out. Somebody does good, they get jealous because he's not getting the credit. Anytime I don't like it, I'm going to quit. Anything happens I don't like, I'm going to pout. And I want any position that anybody's got that's getting more credit than I do. You ever seen a team play like that? I'll tell you one worse. <laughs> I've seen a church play like that. And it ain't a good thing. Amen? Yeah. Go ahead and amen. I know I'm right. <laughs> well, don't amen. <laughs> Paul tells listen. I want to hear that you're standing fast in one spirit. I want to hear that you're all with one mind striving together for the gospel. Uh, Jude, basically, made this same, uh, or, or expressed this same sentiment. Jude, uh, verse number three, that you should earnestly contend for the faith. You may be wondering, why would God, if this is his book, like you say it is, why would God want his people and be using an analogy of wrestling and with the word of God? In mind? Why, would that, why would he want Jude to, Jude to say, to earnestly contend for the faith? Well, it's because of this. It's our job as the church to stand up for the word of God. 
if you will, to wrestle together for it. We're supposed to learn the Bible. We're supposed to love the Bible. We're supposed to live the Bible. And we're never to let go of the Bible. You see, the church has never been called to edit it or to market it or as to act as public relations for it. If you ever find yourself making apologies for something the Word of God says, you need to highlight that and delete it. You're about to mess up. Amen. That's not our job. It's not the church's job to stay current, nor to follow trends, nor to be stylish on the subject of the Word of God. We're called to wrestle together for the Bible. Amen. You say, man, I don't understand why would that be. Well, I can tell you why, why it is from my perspective. If the liberals were right, then it wouldn't matter. Now, this is a shotgun approach. I don't pretend it to be anything else, but kind of a conglomerate of what we as Bible believers refer to as those with a very loose grip on the Word of God. There's a liberal element that's been around for years and years, it's never going to go away, that basically believe that everybody's pretty good joke just the way they are, because of that, everybody's going to end up in heaven one day. Sin is not a big deal to anybody, especially to God. Sin changes with, the, uh, with society and time. What used to be wrong is not necessarily wrong anymore. Especially what you folks who are so intolerant of the rest of us think to be wrong. We're more tolerant than you are. And the list could go on and on and on and on. But listen, if the liberals and the liberal persuasion were right, it wouldn't matter. We wouldn't have to be wrestling for the Word of God. And we wouldn't have to stand up in our pulpits and behind our teaching lecterns and do everything we can to make people understand what the Bible is really saying. But the Bible says of itself that it's the Word of God. The Bible says that we were made to serve Him. Amen. The Bible says that it's by obeying His Word, that's the way we serve Him. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us that not serving Him is sin, and that the wages of this sin is death. The Bible tells us that everyone has sin, but that there is a remedy both for this sin, its guilt and its power, but it's available to whosoever will. You've got to take the time. You've got to make the effort. You've got to decide on your own part which way you're going to go with the Bible. That's what the Bible says. And it's our job to hold that thing up and let people know what it says. I heard an old boy say one time, it's no longer a matter of what does it say, it's only a matter of what are you going to do with what it says. Amen. If the liberals were right, it wouldn't matter. But they're wrong. That's right. You say, well, I ain't sure. That's fine. That's your prerogative. That's completely up to you. But once you've made your mind up of what the Bible says, you know, that's the way you're going to have to go. Amen. And that choice is yours, and you're going to stand before God one day and give account of your life. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Amen. Right. You know, that's what we have, why we have to wrestle together for the Bible, the Word of God. The Bible hasn't changed, and there are plenty of copies available. Anybody can check it out for themselves. Anybody, any time, for any reason. The problem is, folks today are becoming more and more and more intolerant of having it preached anymore. And that's even in the church. Mm -hmm. I wish it won't so, but I know that it is. And that's why Paul, it would appear to me, listed the third aspect of church behavior that's appropriate for a citizen of the kingdom of God, Verse 28, that in nothing we're terrified by our adversaries. This is what Paul wanted to hear from the Philippian disciples. This is what God wants to find out about all of we disciples today. That in nothing we're terrified by our adversaries. There are those who will oppose us. Anybody? There are people who see things differently than the way we do. Uh, I was at a wedding, 
I'm telling you the truth. If you're not going to believe it or you're thinking about it, it wouldn't make any difference to me. I heard an old boy say, we're fixing to have a meal, refreshments, or whatever it is, the reception after this wedding. And we're going to pray and ask God's blessing on both the refreshments, the food, and on the cocktails. <coughs> now, that may not be a big deal to you. That's a big deal to me. <laughs> you know, we're seeing changes. They're taking place all around us. There are going to be those who oppose us. But God, through the apostles, says we're not to let this two different viewpoints on this word terrified. Terrified. One group basically said needs to be frightened. Could have come from a certain root word. The other group says that the root word it came from was the Greek word patuo, which means to spit. You don't say spit in the pulpit. <laughs> so it would appear to me, uh, just as a disciple like yourself, the thing goes in one or both directions. Don't let anything that anybody who opposes you and the gospel do scare you. Or don't let anything that anybody does who's opposed to you to the word of God cause you such disgust that your only response would be. I.e., don't be shaken by your adversaries. Well, how could that be? One answer and one alone. Because we know what's going on. I'm going to hurry through these last references. You're welcome to follow if you want, along if you care to. Matthew 24. Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, Olives, answering a question his disciples had asked. When uh, are all these things going to happen? When are you going to return? What's going to be the sign of your returning? Verse 6, he says, you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you don't be troubled. These things must come. Those of you who are as old as I am have lived through a lifetime of nothing but war and the threat of war. And it's not stopped. It's only increased. This would be enough to trouble anybody, except for somebody who knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. Second Timothy chapter 3, passing over a couple for time's sake. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse number 2, speaking of the last days, men are going to become lovers of their own selves. I've read that so many times, I fear becoming callous to it. You may not share this opinion. I think if we're not there, we're all but there. We're living in a world where everybody loves themselves more than anybody. That's the only thing that could account for the actions that we see in so many folks. And we're not to let these things bother us, though, because we know they're coming. I mean, that's why we're told. In fact, 2 Timothy 3, 13, the disciple knows that evil men and dis dis seducers shall wax worse and worse. It's only going to get worse. I'll bless your heart, amen. But since we know what's coming and what's going on, God says, don't let it bother you. Don't let it bother you. You walk out your, your, kitch, your uh, kitchen door tomorrow morning. I don't know what the weather holds for us. You walk out the door 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. It's 85 degrees. The humidity is 912. <laughs> I've actually felt my body start to form condensation because our house is cool and the back porch is hot as you know where. And I'm thinking, I can't stand it. And then I'm reminded, it's summertime, Hoss. And it's summertime on the Outer Banks. And that's just the way it is. Oh, yeah, okay. Sweat glands, have I? That's all I can tell you. We know what's coming. Finally, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 3. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You know the word literally means won't put up with. That's inside the church, y'all. So Paul says, listen, in nothing, 
in nothing to be terrified, bothered, waylaid in any way, shape, or form. Let it affect you, those who are your adversaries, because we know what's going on. We're headed for a day when even in the church, folks won't want to hear the Word of God. To a disciple, there's nothing any sweeter, smoother, or more satisfying than the Word of God. Now, He'll wear you out. Now, I admit that. You know that. God can get you where nobody else can. And He can even hit a moving target. Amen? When He's got an issue in your life, because you belong to Him, because you gave Him your life, and He took you at your word, He's going to nail you. It's going to happen. He's that faithful. That's why the Bible says, don't let it bother you when He starts chastising you, because that's a sign that He loves you. We know what's going on. We know what's coming. I'll close by saying this. Paul says, when your adversaries start kicking up a fuss, when there are so many that are opposing you that it would cause you to be afraid or to be so disgusted you can't sit still and want to spit. He says, listen there in Philippians chapter 1. This is a sign. Uh, this is an indicator, uh, if you will. Verse number 28. It's a to an evident token. To lost people, when what's going around doesn't ruffle our feathers, it's an indicator to them that we're on one side and it's the right side that they're not. I have found you can get people mad right off the bat today to indicate, to implicate that there are some folks who are lost. They're not going to heaven. Not unless they do something different. Marty handed me a track not long ago. The cover said, what must I do to go to hell? He opened the cover and it simply said, nothing. Oh, I'm offended that you would think that someone might literally go to hell. Y'all, I'm not even might. And, and it's a fact. Amen. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, because the Bible says that, and that's where I've planted my feet, and I hope that you have too. But as an indicator to those that their lifestyle is not what they could have, is watching you in the face of adversaries stand straight, stand tall, just keep on getting it done. Mm -hmm. But it's also an indicator to save folks. The very fact that you can stand there without being ruffled comes from one thing. Your grasp of the Word of God by the grace of God and it's a token of your salvation. You all, everybody here, forgive me for sounding like I'm patronizing. Faith is real. We don't fear death. I mean, I agree with Paul. To die, I'd be better off. Yeah. Got a notice in the mail yesterday. Fees due. This coming a day when ain't going to be no fees due. Yeah. I like that. It's real. I've not always been like that. I used to always sit on the back row. No offense, Jerry. I did it so I could get out quickest. Right. Back in the days when if you didn't come to the preacher, the preacher go to you, Jonathan. I can remember them coming back and taking you by the hand while they're up there playing just as I am. And I'm thinking, man, leave me alone. Oh, no, not in them days. Old preacher asked one day, raise your hand if you're saved and you know you're going to heaven. Ask the next question. You're not saved, but you want to get saved so you can go to heaven. Then he took off down the aisle, and everybody that did not raise their hand, he went to them. Why not? <laughs> That's worse than going to the principal's office. <laughs> Something's changed. You're here today. I don't know where your level of Christianity is, but there are things in the Bible that you once didn't believe, and now both you believe them, and they bring joy to your heart. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know how it's... It's going to all play out. I don't know how I'm going to win, but I know I'm going to win. Amen. I know it's going to work. Hallelujah. I mentioned that just to say faith is real. 
Amen. You can stand in the face of your adversary, those that oppose you, whether it be thought or person. It's an indicator to you. you got to hold of something real. Amen? Go on home, skin the bark off an electric cord, so you got both pieces of copper show. Amen? If you ain't heard a word I said, try this. Plug that bad boy in the outlet, walk over there, wet your fingers, wet your lips, grab hold of it with your right hand, I promise you, you're going to know something got hold on me. Amen? It may not be as quick, but it'll last longer, sting deeper, and be better. Come to Christ. It's real. The clouds one day going to roll like a scroll. I've always wondered, what's that going to leave up there, brother? The cloud is gone. The sky is gone. It's going to be a white horse. Mm -hmm. An old boy sitting on it. has got writing on his thigh and on his forehead. Here it comes. Trumpet sound it ain't gonna be like those sirens coming up the road. Angels start gathering folks from the four corners. He said, "Come, you don't really believe in that, do you? Not only do I believe it, I'm looking forward." To it. Amen. 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 I'm asking to pray with me. I'm just gonna ask God's blessing one more time today. This morning that he'll help us do anything that needs to do. Father, in Jesus' name, oh, how weak I am. Oh, how unlike you I am. Oh, God, how great you are. And how grateful we are for your Bible. It tells us of a God that's so loving. Gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, be there one here today struggling in any way, shape, or form. Help that one to see it's a very good <coughs> chance that that struggle has been sent by you just to bring them on in closer. Be that one who's never given their life to you. God somehow caused today to be that day. There may be that one that's not walking closely with you like they used to be. God, please make this the day. And come on back home like they are to. Whatever the case is, God, we're going to ask you to do what only you can. In these closing words, seal to our hearts the truths of the Word of God. And remind us, if you will, of that place called Calvary, where Jesus suffered, died, paid a debt. Because of that, it would take us away.